Hey, how's it going? And welcome back to Consuming Cinema, a show about making and pairing food and drinks from popular movies and TV shows. Today, for our first ever and long overdue TV episode, we are making a Flaming Homer, or Mo, with donuts from The Simpsons. If you haven't seen The Simpsons. It's an animated sitcom created by Matt Groening, which started as a recurring sketch on The Tracy Ullman Show before first debuting on Fox in 1989. And over the course of its 32 seasons, the show has won 34 primetime Emmys, holds multiple world records, and may or may not be able to predict the future. The Simpsons follows the Simpsons, comprised of their son Bart, daughters Lisa and Maggie, and parents Marge and Homer, a man who loves one food more than anything. Mmm, pancakes. No, not that one. Fish. No. Mmm, marshmallow. No. Mmm, Snickers pie. Wrong again. Mmm, grapefruit. God, no. Mmm. Horse dubers. Stop. No, I'm of course talking about Homer's love of mm, donuts. That's it. That's right. Homer loves donuts more than any other food on the planet. Homer loves donuts so much that in one Treehouse of Horror episode, he even sells his soul to the devil for a single donut. Mm, forbidden donut. But what to pair with Homer's iconic treat? Well, Homer's favorite brand of beer, Duff Beer, is certainly always an option. But what happens in the unfortunate case when Duff Beer isn't regularly available? <coughs> like in Season 3, Episode 10, when Homer's local watering hole, Moe's Tavern, runs out of beer. So Homer tells Moe of a cocktail he created, which he calls... A Flaming Homer. Which he invented one night from a combination of various alcohols in his cabinet, as well as one secret ingredient, Krusty the Clown cough syrup. It's a cocktail so high a proof that when Patty's cigarette falls into it, it immediately bursts into flames, prompting Homer to taste the drink once more and declare, Fire made it good. Both Mo and the customers love the drink so much that Mo steals Homer's idea, renames his bar after the drink, and changes the name of the Flaming Homer. Mo, it's called the Flaming Mo. That's right, the Flaming Mo. My name is Mo and I invented it. That's why it's called the Flaming Mo. But before we make our Flaming Homer, we're first going to make a grape syrup, which will replicate the Krusty the Clown cough syrup. Our grape syrup starts with two cups of grapes. We're then going to put those grapes in a medium saucepan, followed by two-thirds of a cup of grape juice. I'm using Welch's. And then we're going to add one and a half cups of granulated sugar. Then we're going to bring this mix to a boil for five minutes, and then simmer it for 30 minutes. And afterwards, we'll then strain and funnel this into a bottle, pressing down on the grapes with a spoon like we've done with all of our other fruit syrups. Now we're going to refrigerate this grape syrup until we're ready to make our flaming homer. Now it's time to get started on our donuts, which between me and my fiance Bailey took nine times to get right. Nine times. Nine times. This process is not easy, and on my first dough, my main problem is I used way too much flour. Additionally, I made the mistake in a lot of my early doughs of using cinnamon, which is actually an antifungal and can kill your yeast, so don't use it. Another thing I did is I used a no-knead recipe, and while the hand mixer will eventually appear in a later recipe, I found additional kneading with your hands to be quite necessary. I also cut the first batch with two pastry cutters, which although entirely suitable, makes them far less uniform than donuts made with a single donut cutter. Furthermore, in a lot of my early batches, I fried these donuts at too low of a temperature, and in far too much volume of oil, but we'll get to all that later. Overall, this first batch of donuts was just way too cakey and bread-like, and didn't have the signature yeasted taste or donut texture that I was looking for. My second dough's main problem is that I used way too much butter, an entire stick as a matter of fact. So while I at least kneaded my dough for the first time by hand, or you know, at least attempted to knead until my fiance Bailey took over to show me how it's really done, the texture of the donuts in dough number two were far too flaky and somewhat croissant-like to be a perfect donut. <laughs> dough number three was the first time I actually weighed out all my ingredients, which I highly recommend doing. Another positive with dough three is that it was the first time we actually used a donut cutter, which can be very helpful. But where this dough really failed, similarly to the other two, is that we were still frying at too low of a temperature. So while these donuts were golden brown, they didn't have the signature donut center ring around it that I was really looking for. It also still had way too much butter, making it a bit more like a cronut than a donut. Oh, 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 oh. 
On my fourth attempt, I first experimented with using active dry yeast, when on my previous three attempts, I used instant yeast, which they say you can mix directly into your dry ingredients, but as we'll come to find, they might be wrong. Regardless, the fourth batch of donuts, while they looked marginally better, were again more like cronuts than they were donuts. Attempt number four was also the first attempt at frosting, which is something that is almost equally as hard to perfect as the donuts themselves. Uh -oh. For the fifth batch of donuts, I tried an entirely new method of making donuts, which involved cutting individual pieces from the dough and then rolling those little donut pieces into balls before then doing two separate proofs. And while these donuts did indeed become a lot poofier, they still didn't have the proper texture. Oh! The sixth dough was a dough I woke up one morning to find Bailey making a batch of on her own from a recipe that will ultimately become our final recipe, courtesy of the wonderful V over at V Loves to Cook, whose channel and video you can watch here. Unfortunately, we didn't get much footage of this batch because I was making another failure of a batch in dough seven. But what I can tell you is that Bailey's donuts proofed beautifully, fried beautifully, and Bailey was able to make in one try what ultimately took me eight tries. Dough. Speaking of the failure that was dough seven, while I had finally figured out that I should be using bread flour for its high protein content, I was still using way too much butter, resulting in yet another Krona. No! On the eighth batch of donuts, we knew we had finally tracked down the perfect recipe, which I'll explain in more detail shortly. Our problem was is that we didn't control the temperature of our ingredients and, again, may have accidentally added too much butter, which I cannot stress enough can be a fatal flaw in donut making. So after hours of kneading this dough, it was never actually able to fully come together. We didn't even get to cut or fry batch eight. Ah! Nuts. And finally, here's how we succeeded with dough number nine, which starts in a big bowl or stand mixer. Additionally, we'll need 27 grams of warm water, heated to exactly 105 degrees Fahrenheit, to which we'll add two teaspoons of instant yeast, as well as half a teaspoon of sugar. Now mix that all together, and then we're gonna let this yeast activate and rise. While in a third bowl, we'll prepare our dry ingredients, which starts with 240 grams of bread flour, to which we'll add 20 grams of sugar, in addition to one quarter teaspoon of salt, as well as the one constant throughout every recipe we made, a generous, and I mean generous, grating of nutmeg. The nutmeg is what gives the donuts their signature donut flavor. Now, mix that all together, and then we're gonna just set our dry ingredients aside. While in a big bowl or stand mixer, we'll prep 136 grams of milk, as well as one egg, in addition to half a teaspoon of vanilla extract, and two tablespoons of melted and cooled butter. And we're gonna mix these wet ingredients together, we're first going to use our whisk attachment before adding in our now activated and risen yeast. So on the lowest setting, mix in your yeast, being careful not to kill it. Now we're going to mix in our dry ingredients, about half a bowl at a time, scraping down the sides of the bowl as necessary. Then, once everything is seamlessly mixed together, we will then switch to a dough hook attachment, which is going to start the kneading process of this dough. And you want to do this at high speed, and you really want the dough hooks to make contact with the bowl underneath the dough, which will likely shake every everything in sight. And as you work the dough with the dough hook, you'll notice that the dough will start pulling away from the sides of the bowl, which is exactly what you want to see. You're eventually going to notice that the dough starts riding up on the sides of the dough hooks. And that's when you want to scrape down the sides of the dough hooks and then repeat this process a couple times over. And once that dough has ridden up a few times, we will then scrape it down again and then we will begin kneading the dough by hand. The dough should be very sticky but still able to detach from your hands. Feel free to use a bench scraper if you need help getting the dough off of your surface cleanly. Now, another thing we learned in this process is that proper kneading technique is crucial to good donuts. I myself am an absolutely awful kneader, while Bailey is quite spectacular and a total natural at it. So while she tried to teach me the proper technique, at a certain point I just had to step aside and let the master work. But I do feel lucky to have found somebody who, a bit like Marge to Homer, succeeds in many, if not all the ways I tend to fail. Don't you see? Our differences are only skin deep. But our seams go right down to the bone. And after she was finished kneading, Bailey performed what's called a window paint test. If you can stretch the dough without breaking it, it means the gluten has properly developed. Then Bailey handed the finished dough off to me, and I tossed the dough in my hands to make it look like I knew what I was doing, and then I placed that dough into an oiled bowl. Then you want to cover the bowl with a damp kitchen towel, and then you want to stick this bowl in a turned off oven. And then on the rack beneath it, you want to stick another bowl, 
or pot filled with boiling water that will help proof our donuts. Then, after about 90 minutes of rising, your dough will look like this, more than doubled in size. And then you want to deflate the dough by pressing your fist into it. And then you want to fold the sides back into the hole, which is a very important step we discovered because it redistributes the gluten. Then you're going to want to cover your work surface in flour, and then we're going to set our dough onto the surface, and then you want to gently roll it out. And I do mean gently because you don't want to overwork this dough. We want our donuts as puffy as possible. Then we're going to cut our donuts. And while I ultimately used a real donut cutter for this, you can use two different size pastry cutters if you want as well. And once your donuts are cut, you want to immediately transfer them onto some parchment paper that has been pre-cut into squares. Then you want to set them onto plates and batches and allow these donuts to proof one more time in the oven. This is an incredibly crucial step in making perfect donuts as it allows them to get to that naturally poofy state that we're looking for. And while those proof, you can re-roll and re-knead the other dough back into a ball. And let this proof again before rolling it back out and cutting more donuts. And once it's time to fry, you want to fill a wok with about an inch to two inches of oil. Then you want to heat the oil to around 370 degrees, substantially higher than majority of my first attempts. What this does is it allows your donuts to cook quickly, only needing about a minute per side. Once the oil is ready, test it out by putting in one of the donut holes, which turned out beautifully despite my fumble trying to get it out at the end. Then place your first donut in with the wax paper, which you then want to quickly remove. And after about a minute, we can flip them over with some chopsticks. Then we'll let the other side cook for a minute. Then we'll see the other side is a perfect golden brown as well. Then after frying, place the donuts on a rack to cool and repeat this process with the other donuts. And we finally achieved that nice, perfect donut tan line that we've been looking for. And once all of your donuts have fully cooled off, you can then get started on your frosting. And you can really make whatever kind of donuts you want, be it powdered or cinnamon sugar. But for these donuts, we really wanted to achieve that classic Simpsons look. Our frosting starts with two cups of confectioner sugar, which we'll sift into a bowl. But don't sift it in a sloppy way, but rather do it neatly like this. Then we're going to add one tablespoon of milk at a time, being careful not to add too much as we want a thicker coat of frosting for these donuts. Then we're going to add some pink food coloring, as well as even more white food coloring than pink, which will give the frosting that nice opaque look we're going for. And then mix it all together, and I came to find that you also need just the tiniest drop of violet food coloring in order to give it that perfect Simpsons look. Then we want to practice frosting with our donut holes. And before the frosting dries, you then add your rainbow sprinkles. Mm, sprinkles. And then frost your other donuts, twisting slightly as you pull it out of the icing. And of course, after frosting each donut, you have to add more sprinkles. Mm. Sprinkles. And once your donuts are all frosted and sprinkled, it's finally time to make our flaming Homer. Now, in the episode, we see that Homer has a variety of different liquors on the table, including tequila, and some peppermint schnapps, and some creme de menthe. But, while still staying true to the episode, I wanted to pull some random things out of my own liquor cabinet to hopefully give this drink a bit more of a theme. So we're ultimately going to be going for a sort of mint berry margarita flavor profile. So that's why I've been smelling margaritas at 3 a.m. Like Homer's on the show, our Flaming Homer starts in a blender, to which we'll add three ounces of Blanco tequila. I'm using Espolón. In addition to a quarter ounce of creme de menthe, I'm using the clear as opposed to the green. Next, you're going to need a quarter ounce of Chambord. Last seen in our Killer Clowns episode, you can watch here, followed by a quarter ounce of Slow Gin, which is a lower proof gin made with slows, which are a relative of the plum. Then we're going to add a quarter ounce of blue curacao, followed by the juice of half a lime, as well as the juice of half a lemon. Then we're going to add a quarter ounce of peppermint schnapps. And finally, we're going to add one ounce of our grape syrup that we made. And then we're just going to blend this all together, revealing its spectacular purple color. Purple. And then we're just going to set our Flaming Homer aside for a moment while we plate our donuts. Now, to plate our donuts, I'm going to plate one for myself, and then I decided to construct a pyramid of donuts behind it, which Bailey thought I was probably building too high, and, like the rest of the episode, I probably should have listened to her. Now, into this expensive Duff beer mug that I unfortunately won't even be able to see really well once I pour this dark drink into it, you want to pour in your Flaming Homer. And to achieve our flaming effect, we're going to take a quarter ounce of overproof rum, like this lemon heart. 151 and we want to take the back of a bar spoon and pour that rum over the back of the bar spoon 
This allows the rum to float above the rest of the cocktail. We will then light the float of rum on fire, and while you might not be able to see it at first, once you sprinkle with a little garnish of cinnamon, you will see the flames erupt. When a fire starts to burn, there's a lesson you must learn. Something, something, then you'll see. You'll avoid catastrophe. And at long last, your flaming homer with donuts is finally done. Now all that's left to do is put out this flame, and then we'll take a bite of our donut. The only thing to really say is, Mmm, donuts. We finally did it. We made the perfect donut. Texturally, it's truly perfection. Pillowy, yeasty, melt-in-your-mouth delicious. But how does this donut go with the Flaming Homer? Well, it passed the first test. I didn't go blind. And I gotta say, I'm actually pretty stunned by this cocktail. It's like there's a party in my mouth and everyone's invited. The sweet berry flavor mixed with that cinnamon, it's almost like the flavor profile of the fruit filling you sometimes find in donuts. There's just sort of something surprising about it that works. Mm. Something. I even had Bailey try this cocktail just so I wasn't fooling myself into thinking it tasted good. And even she dignified it with a surprised, Hmm, not bad. I want to mention that this cocktail is pretty high proof. So, you know, have fun with it, but be safe as well. To alcohol, the cause of and solution to all of life's problems. <laughs> So between how much I failed on the donuts and how disgusting this cocktail initially sounded to me, I was fully expecting this pairing to be two thumbs down, but it ended up going so well together that I have to give it two thumbs up. If you like the channel, please like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Tell us what you'd like to see. Please leave any video suggestions in the comments below. Full recipes will be included in a link in the video description. Follow us on all social media at Consuming Cinema. And don't forget to join us next week when we make a pairing from Pineapple Express. Thank you for watching. And if you stuck around this long, please enjoy this behind the scenes audio of what happens when I unintentionally give myself the cinnamon challenge. <coughs> Okay. Yeah.